Hello. Hi, everybody. Hello, elephant lovers. Hello, Oakland Zoo friends. This is Amy, Conservation VP at Oakland Zoo, welcoming you to join us. It's dark. It's darker than it usually is. We have switch times, so we have more crazy lights in this room. We are welcoming you all to Cocktails and Conservation, where we're going to be talking about elephants. Really going to be honing in on an amazing project. So if you're an elephant fan, come around, sit around, join us. I definitely am. Again, this is Amy, VP of Conservation at Oakland Zoo. You are joining us for Cocktails and Conservation, um, and we're excited. As I always say, it is a joy to share this planet with wildlife, with all animals. And um, it's just part of the wonder of being alive. I know everyone who's joining us feels that way, but it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And Cocktails and Conservation is all about um, sharing a little hope, some great ideas, and some great projects um, like our amazing guest and project tonight. Again, you're joining us for Cocktails and Conservation, and we're so glad to have you. You're watching Cocktails and Conservation, where we rendezvous with inspiring wildlife conservation leaders from around the planet, hear their stories, learn how they protect the animals we love, and how each of us can help them. With our featured custom cocktail, together we toast to Taking Action for Wildlife. We rendezvous with inspiring wild. All right. Welcome back. You are at Cocktails and Conservation. This is our last one of the season. So we're glad to have you. And it's a it's big finish with a big project. So again, Cocktails and Conservation is where we can gather safely. Um, I know we're kind of virtual out, but we like to think this is kind of special. Um, we gather hope here. We listen to stories of heroes and projects from around the world. Um, we hear their stories and we figure out how we can be part of it. Um, this is a creation of a conservation community. It's not passive listening. Um, you can ask a question. You can be part of it. We're going to give you actions you can do to be part of the solution. Again, I'm your host of Cocktails and Conservation, Amy, and we're so glad you're here. So who are you? And Tell us, um, where are you tuning in from? What is your name? Um, how did you hear about this? Um, we're just glad to have you. All right, so we've got people from Oakland Zoo, friends of Big Life, um, anyone from the AZA, um, community of our volunteers, friends of the wild, we are very glad to have you all. So thanks for letting us know where you're tuning in from and how you found out about it. All right. so. Today we are talking about conserving elephants. Not just elephants, we're talking giraffes, rhinos, lions, the big life that is part of this beautiful part of East Africa, Tanzania and Kenya. Um, Oakland Zoo is really dedicated to this part of the world. We've been working with Ambicelli Trust for Elephants for 30 years. Um, and this project is kind of what makes it work for Ambicelli and other organizations in this area. It's kind of an overall way to do the protection that is needed. So we were so glad to meet this group and start hearing all about what they do. And this is my first time I get to sit with you all and learn about everything they do. So with that, we have a really special guest. Um, her name is Amy. And um, she is the deputy director of Big Life USA. So I love reading about Amy. She's done a lot for marine mammals, for the climate. She has a big resume with a lot of different um, aspects of skills, which probably makes her great at her job. So I'm going to introduce her and bring her on. And we're going to get to hear all about how she got where she is, what the issues are in this area, and what Big Life is doing about it. And um, if you would like to drink your Big Life Breeze sooner than later, the recipe will be in the chat. All right. I would like to, right now, welcome Amy. Hi. 
Hi there. Welcome, Amy. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah, you pronounce it Baird? Yes. All right. Um, we are so glad to have you. So we ask everybody, Amy, where are you and how are you? We're still in the throes <laughs> of this crazy thing, and I know it's still affecting everybody. So just let us know where you are and how you are. I'm good. Big life is good. You know, we're getting ready for a busy holiday season, as we know everyone is. So it's really nice to say hi to you before everything kind of kicks off for the end of the year. I didn't realize I was the last guest for the, for this season. So thank you. I feel like a bit of a guest of honor. <laughs> Um, I'm calling in today from Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. I wish I was in Kenya. Unfortunately, it's a little too early in the morning for anyone from Kenya to be participating with you today. So I'm happy to represent and answer any questions and have a chat. Um, we are very happy to have you. And yeah, you're you're in the perfect zone for us here in Oakland, California. <laughs> so Amy, you haven't, been, I know you probably would love to be in Kenya. Has COVID held you back from being able to be out there? Yeah, the last time I was over was February 2020, just before everything shut down. So at least I got to squeeze in a, a trip before, you know, travel restrictions went into effect and, and see my team, but definitely eager to get back over and, and reconnect with all of the projects that we've got going because things have not slowed down despite the pandemic for conservation. I bet you it's probably gone up due to the pandemic. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to go there, Amy, but, you know, right now we're just going to get into you. So... Here you are, loving life in the field. I mean, what <laughs> brought you to this position? Like, what was your what was your path? I've always been a nature nerd and an animal nerd in particular. Um, so it was a pretty easy choice early on to want to go into conservation. And I was most um, most inspired, I think, to become involved in conservation issues directly by my study abroad experience in Costa Rica. And I lived in a small fishing town where it turned out that shark finning and uh, sea turtle egg harvesting and poaching was actually a pretty serious issue. And, and I had really great teachers that made sure to, to educate us about those issues. So that kind of opened up my eyes to a lot of what was happening internationally, um, besides what happens just here in the US, You know, growing up watching the forests around my neighborhood get torn down for subdivisions and all of that. I mean, it's definitely easy to see how we need to protect our wild spaces and protect our wildlife um, to preserve that natural heritage, uh, regardless of where you are in the world. But definitely all of these issues are intertwined. So mm -hmm. absolutely. All right. So you came to to this incredible job with this incredible organization and you get to well, in this photo, it seems like you're gazing upon <laughs> This incredible, beautiful species. So what is it that, like, what do you love about this area of the world and the animals that you get to protect? I think one of the things that makes uh, East Africa and Ke the Amboseli ecosystem in particular so special is, you know, there's not too many places left on Earth where you see a lot of megafauna existing together in large numbers, particularly large mm -hmm. animals like elephants and giraffes. Um, but also lions and elands and everything else that lives in the ecosystem. You know, growing up in the U.S. here on the West Coast, we had bears, but I was almost an adult before I saw one. You know, they're not super common. Mm -hmm. um, you get raccoons and deer, but it's not it's not the same. And so once you see an ecosystem that sort of represents a glimpse of what the world used to look like, mm -hmm. you sort of realize what we've lost and you are reminded about how important it is to try and preserve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. I've had that feeling of like, oh, this is what the planet wants to have. This is what the planet had or is supposed to have just to, for us to just be one of the gang, one of yeah. the amazing species. Um, yeah, yeah, I love that. That's profound. All right. Well, now is not the fun part, but the interesting part where we really want to dig into really what made big life, you know, become decide to jump into the mix. We'll get to get that after, but we're just going to explore the issues. Um, right. So Oakland Zoo has been um, always focused on the illegal wildlife trade um, with a lot of our projects, but the past year we've super dug in. Um, we really believe that there can be change. There can be some changes in people's personal choices um, that they could make even here. Um, but there's a great opportunity to educate and, and to make some change. So at the very end of this, we're actually going to send everyone a link to a pledge. If you haven't already taken it, 
please do. Um, but this, that's what makes this um, Big Life presentation such a perfect end to our 2021 is um, you guys have just been doing so much. So let's go ahead and show some of these tusks. Amy, tell me like, what are some of the issues in, how do you guys talk about this issue when you talk about it? Yeah. So Big Life's been around for 10 years now, um, but has a, a longer history in that, you know, we, our co-founder Richard Bonham has been in the ecosystem for much longer than 10 years and, and has a long history there. So it's really been amazing to see how all of these issues have changed, not just in the 10 years that Big Life has existed, but even in the 20 years since mm -hmm. Richard's been in the ecosystem. And, you know, poaching used to be rampant across East Africa. Um, and poaching is still a problem across Africa in general, but since we've been able to bring Big Life's rangers on board to start a full-on anti-poaching operation and really spread out across the ecosystem and track down these guys and prevent crime from happening, um, poaching has really um, dropped dramatically in the ecosystem. So it's actually been three years, um, yeah, three years since we've lost a single elephant to poachers in the Ambicella ecosystem, which is 1.6 million acres, which is sort of hard to put in context. It's about 25 square miles. Um, the size of Delaware is the closest yeah. we're able to come up with yeah. as a comparison, a um, which doesn't sound super impressive, but it's a very special and important ecosystem because mm -hmm. it's one of the few places where large herds of, of elephants are able to migrate through multiple national park ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So. Amboseli Trust for Elephants, who you've supported for years, they're based in Amboseli National Park and, and they research all of these animals and Big Life partners with them and helps make sure that these animals, once they leave the national park, are actually protected and that there are forces in, in place to, to prevent illegal crime and, and make sure that they're kept safe while they're moving through community land. So three years is a long time to go without losing an elephant to poachers and knock wood, it'll be another three, but we still lose elephants to other causes. And that's sort of because we've been so effective at focusing on poaching, we've been able to shift our ranger operations to focusing on some other issues. Got it. So um, that's, I mean, it's such good news to hear that. But when we're talking about poaching around the, you know, in other areas um, with elephants, where, you know, who are the people who are doing the poaching? Like who are the people on the ground? Yeah, really good question. Um, and we get this asked this a lot. Um, a lot of it's driven by large organized crime. And I think that's something that gets lost in the conversation because it's very easy to say, you know, go out and get those poachers and shoot those poachers. But the, the guys that are actually out there doing the work um, and committing these crimes, they're not necessarily the bad guys. Uh -oh. They're cogs in a wheel of a much larger criminal structure. And they're desperate and trying to provide for their families and put their kids through school and make sure that their their wives are receiving food. So it's um, it's a much more complicated issue than just criminals going out committing crimes. It's definitely um, an ecosystem where people are trying to make ends meet and trying to survive a changing culture. And so you know, one of the things that, that Big Life does is when we arrest people, we, we definitely make sure that they, they serve their time and they do the maximum sentence. And we've got a whole system in place to, to make sure that that happens. But we also have a history of offering these guys jobs when they get out of prison and they, they need work because otherwise, what are they going to do when they get out? They go right back to poaching because they don't know anything else. But it turns out that um, former poachers are actually really good anti-poaching rangers because yeah. they know all the tricks. They know where everyone's going and, and phone numbers and who to call and where people are stashing ivory. And so it's been um, a really effective program to actually involve the community in the conservation itself. And that really gets to the core of what Big Life is trying to do there. Okay. You guys are brilliant. I love it. Um, okay. So we're just going to show a couple more gruesome photos, but more yeah. explore this. Um, so why would someone poach a giraffe? There's no. Yeah. Good question. Um, and important to note that giraffes are on the endangered species list, which people don't know was a surprise to me. Cause you, when you think of Africa, you think zebras and, and giraffes and you think large numbers of these animals. And, and honestly, there aren't as many as you would expect anymore. And part of that is because of their size, which is the reason why they're targeted. Um, 
bushmeat is actually a pretty mm -hmm. serious issue um, in our area of operation. And when I say we haven't lost any elephants to poachers, that doesn't mean that poaching isn't happening and, and bushmeat poaching is different from trophy poaching. Trophy poaching is where you're killing an animal because you want its tusks or its rhino horn or its, in the case of lions, their teeth or their claws. Mm -hmm. um, but bushmeat poaching is definitely poaching for the meat. And once you kill an animal, you can strip it and skin it and sell the meat at market and make a lot of money, especially if it's an elephant or not an elephant, excuse me, but an animal as large as a giraffe. You know, they're they're enormous and there's an awful lot of of meat on a giraffe. So it's they're definitely targeted. Um, that one there that you see has been snared. And unfortunately, we got to it too late. Um, but our, our patrols do cruise the ecosystem regularly, daily, um, looking for snares and destroying them and removing them from the ecosystem when we can. And, and when we can't, definitely following up on any tracks or trails or, or scent using our tracker dogs to try and figure out, you know, who was responsible and, and make sure that we actually arrest the guys that, that were laying the traps after the fact. Got it. Um, so no shortage of challenges. It's, We'll talk all about mm. the solutions after our drinky. But one thing that I'm so impressed by is like big life is just flexible. You know, they see a new issue and it's time to deal with that new issue. It's always changing. All right. I have a question from Adrian who says, is it legal to sell giraffe meat or is it relabeled as something else in the market? Mm, it's definitely not legal to sell giraffe meat, um, especially because it's an endangered species. But regardless, it's it's a wild animal. And there's Kenya's um, actually one country in Africa where there's no hunting permits um, allowed. So even if, you know, uh, in other countries, there might be hunting permits issued, much like there is in the U.S. for elk and, and other animals, you know, in a really regulated way, that isn't isn't the case in Kenya. So any wild animal that you might find at a, at a market is definitely considered illegal and, and is a criminal act to, to sell it and to consume and purchase it. Um, how would you identify it in a market? I think that's where it gets really tricky and that's why it's important to catch these guys in the act of laying the snares or immediately after um, laying the snares because once the meat has been processed, processed, um, it's definitely difficult to identify what it is and, and where it came from. But I think in the case of giraffe, if you were at a market and you saw a steak the size of <laughs> your automobile, you might wonder what it came from. Yeah. So I think it's maybe more identifiable than some other kinds, but. Got it. It's really amazing to me that there, I mean, we're in Oakland. We have had issues at our port where animals from, you know, meat from East Africa makes its way all the way over. Uh, Absolutely. So the problem is, it's, is global. Um, all right, more questions. So we're, we've talked about poaching and snaring and, you know, the illegal trade in ivory. Um, is, is climate an issue? Is it, is climate change creating challenges as well? Of course, you know, there's big meetings going on right now, um, COP26, and I'm certainly hoping they're talking about the effects of climate on all these species. Maybe yeah. you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. Climate has um, it's a huge issue and it's it's one that that needs to be talked about more, uh, particularly in the ecosystem where big life operates. Um, the seasons used to be almost like clockwork in terms of the rainy, rainy season versus the dry season, which is on the equator. There aren't four seasons like we have elsewhere in the world. Um, it's dry and it's wet. And when it's wet, that's when there's food and grass and enough resources for the wildlife to have their babies. It's critical for the ecosystem. And, and then the dry periods, of course, you know, we've seen more and more severe droughts um, that have caused massive wildlife die offs in the ecosystem. I think the last big one was in 2009. And every year, um, we sort of keep an eye on the rains and, and the total measurements and start to wonder, you know, are we are we ever going to face another major drought and another major wildlife die off like we saw before? And there's a very good chance that we will. Um, in the meantime, the rains have become much harder to predict. They don't come when they used to. And so it's confusing for the wildlife and it's confusing for the, the human populations that live there. And when the rains do come, they come extremely heavy and hard and fast. 
they wash out roads, you know, they, they drown out schools, people die, wildlife struggles. I mean, it's, it's definitely a really intense situation dealing with the wet and dry seasons, but Beyond that, um, we've also seen a, a huge increase in, in fires and our rangers have shifted to needing to learn how to do fire suppression oh and fire management because the ecosystem catches fire with either lightning or, um, you know, poachers in the ecosystem that are maybe lighting campfires and, and not putting them out properly. We've also had some issues with um, folks using smoke to, to flush out honeybees and some of the fire from the embers from that has caused fires. I mean, the whole ecosystem definitely is dry as a tinderbox much of the year. And so it doesn't take much to start a fire, but what little wood there is there needs to be protected for the wildlife to use and, and live in. Um, and also interestingly, one um, thing that I've started to notice more in our sit, sit reps, we get these daily situation reports from our team in Kenya. Um, there's a lot of sandalwood that grows in the ecosystem where Big Life operates. And we've been arresting a lot of people for illegally harvesting sandalwood because sandalwood is actually a protected species because it's so slow growing. Um, and it takes like 15 to 20 years for it to mature before it can be used. And it's a pretty, pretty lucrative product inside of things like incense and candles. Um, anyways, all that is to say, even having forest fires also impacts protected species like sandalwood that we're trying to protect. So it's all, it's all connected, of course. Um, and it's, it's frustrating to see those issues becoming as severe or more severe than, than stopping wildlife crime, but at least we have the resources to, to try and do something. Yeah. About so it. it's a constant research response, re-education, um, of your, of yeah. your staff there. And it makes what you say about sandalwood is like, oh man, like what's, where's my incense from? And this is why everyone, you know, who knows you need to ask so many things that we yeah. purchase here. You know, you ask the question, like, where did you resource this from? Who's your source? And it gets it gets that seller to think about it. You know, who knows who's, you know, stepped out of line of their own belief system and their own ethics and not known about it. So that's good encouragement to, to be inquisitive and to ask. So we have a quick question here from Chantal, who says, has eco travel to Kenya started picking up now that more people are getting vaccinated and countries are starting to open up? Yes. Thank you, Chantal. Great question. Um, 2020, everything shut down entirely and, and travel to Kenya was completely restricted as it was many places. And it was devastating for the economy. So much of the country's economy in general was based on its wildlife tourism because it has such a special wildlife um, wildlife population, not just in the Amboseli ecosystem where, where Big Life is, but also in the Mara and, and other parts around the country. So it was devastating. And we did see um, briefly some surges in, in other types of crime, particularly bushmeat as a result of that, because so many people were out of work. Mm -hmm. But um, in the last six months or so, as, as restrictions have lifted and, and vaccines have become available, um, we've definitely seen an, an increase in, in tourism, and that is wonderful news, not just for the ecosystem where Big Life operates, but for the country in general, because it is such a huge factor. And, you know, they, they export a lot of agriculture to Europe and, and that sort of thing. But getting people over to actually see the wildlife is definitely what is going to encourage folks to want to continue to protect these species. Okay. Everyone, go on safari if you can. <laughs> um, so I kept up this. I kept up this picture of the beautiful ecosystem here. It might be hard to see, but of course, it's like what you said in the beginning. Like, just amazing to see these animals all together. But I understand there has been new challenges around how that ecosystem is set up and divided. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I'm just looking at that photo just to describe it briefly for folks mm -hmm. listening. That's Mount Kilimanjaro in the background, the sort of shrouded in clouds, and a herd of elephants in Kimana Sanctuary, which is a, a small conservancy that Big Life has taken over management of protecting in the last few years. Um, and it's an absolutely special place and is a great place to visit. Um, and one of the reasons why that ecosystem in general is, is so abundant is because the snow that falls on that mountain melts over the course of the day and all that water feeds down into the valley and fills the swamps of Amboseli National Park. So there's year-round abundant water, but that year-round abundant water also means that there's um, the possibility for um, 
farming and other water uses that maybe weren't um, part of the culture before. So we're, we're definitely seeing a shift from the local Maasai tribe that's lived there for a long time um, from being primarily pastoralist and cattle based society to being more agricultural based and needing to irrigate their farms and, and grow crops and, and live a more stable lifestyle, which has put some new strains on, on the ecosystem. But I think what, what Amy was getting at is one of the things that we have been watching and are actively participating in now is, you know, up until very recently, the ecosystem where Big Life operates has been um, communally owned lands where the there's been five or so called group ranches, which the equivalent here would be like a county, I guess, in the States, um, where the land has been shared at, by the tribal members of that um, as a group. And so in the last five to six years, there's been a shift towards restructuring how land ownership in Kenya works in general from communal ownership to individually held um, parcels. And so this subdivision par process is converting a large ecosystem from a few jointly held um, large parcels into thousands of individual parcels where people will have titles and can buy and sell their lands, which is great news for the individual tribal members that live there that want to, to you know, to develop or, or sell their, their property. But it also means major changes for the ecosystem, particularly elephants like you see in that photo there that that move thousands of kilometers. I mean, elephants don't stay inside of small fenced areas. Neither do lions, neither do giraffes. Um, these are large herds of moving animals that need space to move around. And when you start thinking about, you know, thousands of acres that have been opened and, and unfenced for millennia to suddenly 40 acre parcel plots that someone might want to fence because they want to keep elephants out of their new tomato farm, um, it's going to change the ecosystem quite dramatically. So the local community actually came came to Big Life and asked us to, to support these efforts to make sure that as part of the process, there are areas that are set aside that can be kept open for both wildlife and for grazing um, with livestock, um, which is a mutual benefit that serves the community and serves wildlife. So it definitely taps into big life's ethos that if conservation supports the people, people are far more likely to support conservation. So it's a win-win, um, but making sure that there's particularly migratory corridors where we know wildlife are moving through regularly um, to connected ecosystems, um, that those are protected and, and preserved as conservation corridors and, and will be saved for a long time and, and won't get fenced off and parceled up and turned into who knows what. So um, it's definitely a long process and it's just the start of it. Obviously you start talking about parcels and subdivision and titling and gazetting and my eyes glaze over just thinking about it, but oh. it's a really huge issue and it's incredibly important and it's very expensive process to go through in terms of land assessments and everything else that you can think of that would be involved in subdividing an ecosystem that's over a million acres. So um, definitely a challenge. Yeah, I just want to to like shine a light on what you said there, Amy, and that's that the community members came to Big Life. Mm, and you yeah. know, how, you know, that's, if there's not a sign of success, <laughs> if that's not a sign of success, I don't know what is to show how trusted you are in that community, that you, Big Life is part of, of futuristic thinking of what we want here um, on our land. So um, congratulations on that. And wow, you got a lot of work to do there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that definitely gets to the heart of why Big Life is a successful organization is it's, it is community driven and we don't have programs that the community don't want. There wouldn't be any point in that and they wouldn't be successful or effective. Mm -hmm. So you know, that is kind of the heart of what we do. Yeah. Okay. We are now at that point where we get to take a drink. So we're very excited. Um, the bar that is our sponsor drink maker is one of my favorite bars in Oakland. And Amy, when you visit next time, we're going to go. Um, it's called yeah. the Alley. Who's been to the Alley? It's just so unique. It looks really like 
one of those hole in the wall bars that's your favorite, favorite one, but it's really just their style. It feels like you're going into a beautiful wooden cave, but they have a piano bar mm -hmm. and karaoke. So people come and sit around and, and, and sing around the piano. So it's nothing but sweet, good vibes. And they were very excited to, to be our sponsor. So we're going to hear from them and we'll see you on the other side. <laughs> I'm Jackie from The Alley. We've been in business since 1933. We're the Oakland's third oldest bar, and it's such an honor to do this for the conservation. Uh, and I lucked out, I got elephants, and I love elephants, and uh, the ivory poaching is just unreal these days. And I made my drink the Big Life Freeze because elephants love fruity, and let's give it a go. First, we're gonna fill up our pint glass with ice and we're going to use about mm, a half jigger. I did everything in jigger so it would be easy to measure for everyone. A half jigger of grenadine and we're going to use one and a half ounces of Malibu rum. And then to that, we're just going to add one ounce of orange juice, two ounces of pineapple juice, or I'm sorry, an ounce and a half of pineapple juice. And then we're going to, I'm using fresh squeezed lime. You can use grenadine if you like, a half ounce, but I'm just using a half of a fresh squeeze line. I think it's, it gives a little zip to it. And then we're going to top it off with an ounce and a half of Kraken, which is a stark rum. You can use Captain Morgan. Um, you can use Myers. I just like the Kraken. It's a little darker. looks prettier. This is similar to Mai Tai. It's just a few extra ingredients. And then we're just going to top it off with a little fruit and an umbrella to make it look cute. And enjoy. Thanks for coming. All right. Here's me. Yum. <laughs> so we've got a little corny thing that we say to take an action for wildlife to Amy. A big hug. Let's do this together. Chug a lot. Cheers. All right. Hmm. Turn off our little crawler there. And this is where we kind of get into the solution. You know, we've had great questions about them. Um, and we've been talking about it a little bit, but let's dig in, Amy, because the things that you've created in the past 10 years are definitely something to toast to and to celebrate. And we need this kind of hope. So we're excited to, to hear all about it. Um, so first of all, um, like, what was the beginning vision of Big Life? I know this was started by not your typical person. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think I mentioned, you know, we're going or we're exiting our 10th year, actually. Oh, my goodness. We're going into our 11th. Um, so sort of our, our origin story is um, some of our listeners may be familiar with um, photographer Nick Brandt. And he is known for uh, black and white photography and, and has a wonderful body of work, including um, his newest work is just out. Um, but he spent a lot of time traveling to East Africa and photographing animals um, with a film camera, not a digital, and without a zoom and getting really close to some of Ambicelli's most famous elephants. And each time he went back, he realized the elephants that he had been photographing for years and, and had developed these relationships with had been had been poached, had been killed by poachers. And he started looking around to see who he could donate to to help, you know, fund anti-poaching efforts to keep these incredible animals alive. He was he regarded as friends and realized, you know, 
the Kenya government didn't really have the resources to properly tackle the issue outside of the national parks. You know, they have rangers in the national parks and they have police, but, you know, these animals move through large areas and there's no way that the government could could properly protect them the way that they needed to at the at the height of the poaching crisis. So long story short, he, Nick Brandt, started looking around and identified Richard Bonham, um, who'd lived in the ecosystem since the 80s and, and knew the community very well and had already developed a small conservation-based organization called the Masailand Preservation Trust, mm-hmm. MPT. And um, so they already had established relationships with the community. Richard is well-loved and trusted by the community there, um, built one of the one of the early eco-lodges. Um, long story short, they decided to team up together and transform Masailand Preservation Trust into what is today called Big Life Foundation. And um, thanks to some of Nick's collectors, was able to generate a pretty sizable chunk of seed funding to really get the ball rolling and take what was five to 10 anti-poaching rangers and turn it into 40 ranger outposts. And and today we have over 300 uh, trained rangers in the ecosystem operating 24 seven. So it's gone from from small to mighty in a very short amount of time, um, but is, is a pretty incredible success story. And it's built on the fact that the community wants us there. So what you just said is you've gone from a few rangers to 300. And I can only imagine some of them who might have chose poaching at one point is like, why would I do that when I could be part of a family and get a salary and feel proud? Um, What a transformation you've created. And 40 outposts. um, It's incredible. And I have to admit, um, Dr. Parrott, who was our, you know, our director of the zoo for many, many years, he fell in love with Big Life. And I have to say, I'm going to out Dr. Parrott right now that he loved the planes and the dogs and the trucks. So like, just talk about that as one of your solutions, not all of them, Dr. Parrott. Yes. Well, I was very lucky to meet Dr. Parrott and spend some time with him and his enthusiasm for what Big Life does. It was infectious. So congratulations on your retirement, Dr. Parrott. Well earned. Um, Yeah. So in addition to our our Ranger teams, you know, we have two airplanes now um, and 16 vehicles. And basically the point is that we can be anywhere in the ecosystem at any time quickly. So when something happens, the community knows that we are available and we will send someone and that we'll do it within 20 minutes to an hour at the latest. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I've seen this in action when I was actually in Kenya three visits ago, um, there was a sighting, we received a phone call, I was in a meeting, board meeting, and our head of operations received a phone call that there was an elephant that had been spotted with a spear wound. So the troops were rallied and everyone zoomed over to the last known location of this elephant and he was identified within minutes. Um, And then a vet was called in within minutes and honestly within an hour, this elephant had been darted and treated and resuscitated and was back on his feet and out on the road, cruising back into the bush with a bit of a huff. You know, elephants aren't super happy um, to be darted and treated, but he was definitely (laughs) relieved. And we saw him the very next day at the water hole coming in for a drink and seemed none the worse for wear. So it's, it's really the fact that folks know that the action will be taken when those phone calls are placed, that they continue to call and to your earlier point about changing the ecosystem and and why the community trusts us, you know, we hire exclusively from within the local community. So Big Life Today is one of the, I think the largest, but I don't want to speak out of turn. It could be some of the other industries are challenging us now for the title of largest employer in the ecosystem. So it's definitely a, a mark of honor to wear a green uniform. And it it works so well because all of the rangers have families and children that they provide for and all of those family members are proud of their their dad or their brother or their you know cousin who's a ranger and they're far more likely to call and report something mm-hmm. if their family member is getting a paycheck to help protect these animals wow it's incredible well, I'm not surprised that we have a question about the dogs. So I want to <laughs> show Nicole's question. You mentioned tracking dogs being used earlier. Are they specifically are they specifically for tracking poachers or other purposes? 
and thank you. <laughs> The dogs are amazing. Um, we have had a tracker dog unit for many years now, um, which today consists of two tracker dogs and six handlers. And the dogs are fully trained through the, the Kenya government has a, a system for this with their police force. Um, and so they've gone through their, their working training program and their full-time working dogs. So it's Bonnie and Clyde. And they are bloodhounds. And as you can imagine, their noses are phenomenal. Um, and they're just really incredible dogs. Um, we do use them regularly when a crime scene has been identified and we need to track a person, whether it's the person responsible or, or someone involved in the incident. Um, they're very good at, at tracking um, but they're also used for a lot more. Um, in fact, gosh, it was just a few weeks ago, although time has no meaning anymore. It may have been a month or two ago. <laughs> but um, one of our, our sit rep reports showed um, a young kid went missing. You know, a lot of the, the cattle and the livestock in the ecosystem are overseen by very small children. And it's very easy to become disoriented and, and lost in the bush. And obviously that's every parent's worst nightmare. Um, but Big Life was called in within minutes and the tracker dogs were sent out on the scent and the kid was found and, and reunited with his family. Oh, so man. definitely the dogs do much more than just track poachers. They mm -hmm. reunite kids with their families. And we also had an incident last summer that cracks me up where a, a young teenage boy who was getting into trouble in Nairobi um, had been sent out to Ambicelli to live with his aunt and uncle to sort of you know, straighten up a little bit, but he didn't know who Big Life was. He was brand new to the ecosystem and he saw an opportunity to, to steal something out of a, out of a Big Life vehicle and <laughs> didn't know who he was stealing from. And the tracker dogs followed him five kilometers straight into his bedroom and his aunt and uncle gave him <laughs> quite the talking to. That. But I think it was a bit of tough love. But anyways, I love the tracker dogs. I could talk about them all day. They're really great. And they're a really effective deterrent, yeah. which is, um, I think, as important as the actual work they do. Sure. The poachers that would otherwise be committing crimes in the ecosystem, you know, these dogs have legendary noses and, and no one is gonna try and get away with anything knowing that between the rangers the airplanes and the tracker dogs there's a really good chance you're gonna get busted yeah. so yeah it seems like visually to just know that hey you're being watched in a loving way <laughs> and these dogs so maybe pick a new thing to do um, well, I'm yeah. fascinated by the rangers um and i can only imagine like how their lives have changed since they had this job so i would love to hear like about this particular ranger yeah so this guy in this photo with um that's clyde i believe oh. <laughs> um the ranger is mutinda indivo and he is one of our most senior rangers he was actually involved in in big life before big life was big life um but he is um one of the ecosystem's most notorious former poachers and had grown up being trained by his father, who was a poacher, to be a poacher, mm -hmm. never went to school, um, didn't speak English, didn't think he had any job skills and was very good at um, poaching elephants in particular and managed to escape Big Life's rangers dozens of times where we would arrest him and he'd get, you know, put in jail and then somehow he'd slip out and, you know, it just became sort of this, this running thing. And, and Richard um, Bonham, who runs the operations in Kenya, you know, convinced his wife to convince him to sit down and have a conversation and meet. And, and Richard basically told him, he's like, we're never going to stop chasing you. Mm -hmm. Like we're always going to get you and put you in jail. Like this doesn't end well for you unless you make some changes. And so, Mutenda had to think about it. You know, he asked Richard for a little bit of time to mull over his options, but ultimately he came back and said, you know what, I want to do over and thank you for the opportunity. And, and yes, please. So Mutenda has been one of our most trusted Rangers ever since. And he's proud to put on that uniform and he oversees the tracker dog program. Um, and it, 
turns out, you know, all of those years doing unspeakable things, mm -hmm. honestly, um, weren't things that he wanted to do. He just didn't think he had any options. Mm -hmm. And so now he's able to apply what he learned doing that towards stopping it. And he's really good at it. And we're really happy to have Mutenda's help. That's fantastic. And it makes me think like we need programs like that in Oakland. <laughs> mm, Just like yeah. that, you know. Um, I love that. And the other, um, I've read that besides all this amazing work that's protecting the animals, with all this ranger power, I'm assuming they're called to do other things that just help the community. And I was reading that that's the case. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All the time, especially now. Cause it's like, who do you call? You know, you call the guys that you know will show up. So big life shows up. And a few weeks ago, there was a, a pregnant woman who was going into labor and needed a ride to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Big life rangers took her, um, you know, that kind of thing. There was another guy that was in a motorbike accident and broke his leg and was stuck in a ditch and, remembered that he'd seen big life rangers not too far behind him on the freeway and, and made a phone call and they came and picked him up and took him to the hospital. So it's, it's stuff like that, that really reminds you that it's, it's about more than just, you know, the wildlife. It's really about the trust of the community and, and knowing that we have that and that it, it works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's just part of the fabric of this area and how wonderful and lucky for everyone. Um, I love this photo and would love you to tell us like how, what's going on here and how does that help the overall story? Yeah. Uh, that's a great photo taken by my coworker, Jeremy in Kenya. Um, so one of the programs that we're known for and, and is more exciting to talk about is um, the Maasai Olympics oh. and the Maasai Olympics um, were started um, back in 2000 eight was when the idea first got started, but I think the first ones didn't happen until 2010. Anyways, um, in Maasai culture, um, they're famously known as lion hunters. And there's a bunch of movies you may have seen on Netflix that sort of reflect that. Ghost in the Darkness, I just rewatched it recently as one of those. Um, anyways, you, you know, the ecosystem doesn't have enough lions to support that aspect of a culture, Re never mind the fact that it's illegal and it's wrong. Um, and so the elders of the Maasai actually came to Big Life and said, hey, like, we've got a problem here. We don't have enough lions and you can't keep arresting our young warriors for protecting their livestock, for, for spearing lions. Like, how do we resolve this? And, and one of the reasons for that is in Maasai culture to become a man, it's a bit of a rite of passage is to participate in a lion hunt. And so how do you, how do you change culture? How do you convince, you know, a, a society that something they've done for a long time, that is a mark of manhood is, is something that they need to change. And so the elders actually came to us and said, well, isn't sport something that the rest of the world does um, to sort of, get the same point across in terms of impressing women and showing off your prowess on the field and, you know, throwing that spear extra far, wh whatever the case may be. And so the Messiah Olympics were sort of born out of that. And it's become a really effective lion conservation program because every two years, the local communities, um, put their own teams together and they have a series of tournaments to get the best of the best athletes and then all those guys come together into the finals, which we call the Maasai Olympics, and they compete for real prizes, um, not to mention all of the prestige that comes with mm -hmm. the entire ecosystem turns right. out to watch and media from all over the world comes and photographs it. And, you know, there's cash prizes and, and the winning team actually gets a. Oh, we lost her. Um, well, she's going to reach me back. I know she will. I don't know if you have any questions. What is the question you have for me? Like, pop back on. Well, I think it's amazing what she's doing here. Um, I love it. If there's something else you need, you know, in this area, other ways that people can improve themselves, that it doesn't hurt others, it doesn't hurt animals. Um, all right. 
Well, I'm just going to say that while she's coming back, another thing that I thought was amazing um, that Big Life does is they empower women. Um, they empower women on their team. And they particularly empower, this one woman has a great story, and Amy's back to tell us all about it. I don't know what <laughs> happened. She'll be there and went, there you are. Sorry, I don't know what happened. I didn't click anything. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got you. I'm glad you're back. I was prepared to tell a little story, but not as well as you can. So we moved to, you know, you're empowering the men. We're happy about that, but I'm also happy you're empowering women, Amy. <laughs> I love this yes. story because this particular woman looks pretty badass and she looks very empowered. So what is happening here? Well, we're very proud of Joan. Joan works in our um, healthcare programs. You know, we Big Life's programs overall sort of fit into three key buckets, wildlife, habitat, and community. And on the community side, that's really where we keep the hearts and minds of the community on, on our side. And mm -hmm. that involves everything from funding school teachers to, to putting kids through school with wildlife scholarships. We're over 300 now on putting kids through school. Um, but we also have healthcare initiatives. And part of that is mobile health clinics and, and making sure that people have access to immunizations, mm -hmm. um, family planning resources, et cetera. So Joan there okay. that you see with her motorbike um, is one of our um, public health coordinators. And she is the first woman at Big Life to get her motorbike license. So that's a pretty big deal culturally there. And we hope it inspires other women um, to want to get their motorbike licenses because it really opens up a world of opportunity in terms of employment and, and job opportunities. If you can get around the ecosystem, it's a big place. The roads aren't super easy. They're all dirt roads and you know lots of obstacles and wildlife along the way so if you can scooch around on a dirt bike and get to the more remote corners then your your opportunities are endless so we're really happy that joan's got her motorbike license and can safely get out to some of the more remote parts of the ecosystem to disseminate family planning information and and other healthcare benefits Gosh, there must just be kids must be like the young people just must be kind of like in awe of this woman on her motorcycle or the rangers <laughs> in their truck, like to have so. heroes to look up to and so many. Um, it's, it's truly amazing, Amy. Thanks. Yeah. So now I want to ask just as we kind of start to wrap it up a little, like mm -hmm. you've solved so many problems. What are the ones that kind of are on the table now that, that are like, okay, here's the current challenge or the challenge around the bend. Yeah, I think that the biggest focus for us is just continuing to figure out how to mitigate human wildlife conflict. Um, when we talk about land subdivision, that's definitely a, a habitat protection specific thing. But in general, you've got a growing human population in an area where you've also got a thriving wildlife population. And, and how do you make sure that the people are safe and the animals are safe? And, you know, I it'd be much different story for you in Oakland if waiting for the BART, you looked over your shoulder and there was a lion sniffing, you know, and, and coming closer to you, you'd be a lot more inclined to want to protect yourself. And and no one can blame anyone for, for that sort of primal self-preservation instinct that kicks in. I mean, these animals are dangerous, particularly elephants. Elephants are very oh, dangerous. Yeah. They can be very aggressive. They're not, you know, these gentle creatures, they can be very gentle, but they're definitely enormous and they're the most powerful thing and they'll destroy your water tank and eat your whole crop. So how do you keep the wildlife and the people coexisting safely and in a way that doesn't cause a lot of problems? And that's, I think, where a lot of our resources go towards these days is just making sure that we're mitigating the amount of conflict that's happening between both wildlife and human populations and making sure that everyone is, is taken care of. And, and separately from that, that there's land for both to continue to use and enjoy. So mm -hmm. it's definitely a, a huge task and feels very daunting. Um, but I believe that we'll be successful because of all the wonderful things that we've done up until now. Um, I, I will toast to that. I believe in it as well. Um, and what are like, I mean, you've told so many stories that kind of show the success, but what's something that you've seen lately that you just feel like, yeah, 
I'm in the right job and we're doing the right thing. Besides all the ones you've already told us, maybe one more. Um, so it's sort of a bittersweet one. We got a, a letter, um, an email was sent to us by a young woman um, whose father had been killed by an elephant um, six or seven years ago. And it was a horrible incident. It was an accident, it never should have happened. Um, and so Big Life funded her education and she just graduated with a degree in medical lab sciences um, and is gonna come back to the ecosystem and hopefully work. Um, but she basically sent this message to say thank you and to, to see that email come through and, and realize that these, there's long, long standing ramifications for all of the work that we're doing. And it's not just the immediate gratification we get from saving these animals, it's also you know, everything else that goes along with it. So you're creating a scaffolding of, of, of sustainability and stewardship. It's, it's amazing and hopeful. Um, one question we had quickly um, from Linda was like, what are some of the organizations you're teaming up with out in that ecosystem? Oh yeah. Everyone. <laughs> it's a big team effort and uh, we need all the help we can get. So we do partner very closely with the government, the Kenya wildlife service, our big partners of ours, particularly on the anti-poaching side. Um, and then um, I already mentioned Ambicelli Trust for Elephants. They're great friends. Lion Guardians also operates in the ecosystem. Oh, yeah. um, David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust. I think they go by the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust now. Mm -hmm. um, they're great partners of ours as well. So all of the all of the players in the ecosystem have to work very closely together because it's mm -hmm. it's too much work for, for any one group to be responsible for. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's really wonderful to have such wonderful partners, but especially Oakland Zoo. <laughs> <laughs> Not well, really missed, and thanking you for all of the the many years of support we've gotten from you and i remember my first visit down to see the zoo seven years ago and we were one of the quarters for conservation partners yeah. and there was a little sign by the elephants about <laughs> it was amazing so thank you um we are happy to do it um we're just so proud to be associated connected and so what would you say amy could an average pe person like all of us here listening or someone listening to the recording can do um I know we can donate and um, <laughs> I'll have our Oakland Zoo team on the other side working the chat to put in a link there. Um, yeah. Anything an another average person can do? I, you've got good swag, like let me see that cup. These are our new, our new, our new cups. Ah, where's my camera? There you go. Yeah. I want the cup. All so right. we, we're selling merchandise because our supporters, you know, want to be able to show their support. So we do have a little e-store now on our website. Okay. Um, so that's a great way, donations, I mean, it's, it's, it costs 5 million bucks a year to do what we do oh. in ballpark. Oh. Um, and that's a budget that grows every year. So any little amount helps. Um, but beyond that, just telling your friends and family about what's going on in Africa. I know it's, it's hard to talk about getting over there to actually see it. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're ever in a position financially to take a trip and go on safari, putting your buck where your mouth is, is definitely one of the best ways you can support conservation because the biggest argument for protecting these animals is the economic benefit that the local community gets from them. And a big part of that is tourism. So not that there's a financial number on any of wildlife's head at all, but it is a huge driver for the success of these programs all over Africa. And there's a number of wonderful places you can go and really see these places and appreciate just how special it is to, to still have wildlife like this, so. Got it, on it. Um, we have a little video we wanna play for you before we go, but I also wanna say for those listening, um, we'll probably do a few of these next year too, so we would love your feedback on how they work for you, how we can make them better. So a survey will pop there into the chat, as well as that pledge, please take the pledge. Um, myself and my team got to write six very actionable emails um, that everyone can relate to that you'll get when you take that pledge that can help you on your path um, to being part of the solution. All right, Amy, this one's for you. Awesome. 
Um, all right. I hate to say goodbye, Amy. Um, now you can go walk your dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, you, Sana. thank you so much. And if somebody had a question that we didn't answer, we're going to swing back around and try to get that answered for you. And um, thanks for being our big finale, big life. Um, we'll see you soon. Thanks for having me. Okay. <laughs>